Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 30. We saluted with bullets. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Last time, we covered the remarkable early life of Owen Roe O'Neill, the nephew of Hugh O'Neill, the great Earl of Tyrone who had caused so much trouble for Elizabeth I. Owen had spent the last 35 years in effective exile, keeping himself busy as an officer serving in the Spanish Habsburg army at the head of the O'Neill Regiment. He never gave up on returning to Ireland, and more than one plot to inspire rebellion or Spanish invasion had O'Neill in the middle of it. Case in point, the 1641 Irish Rebellion. As the rebellion spread and transformed into a war, O'Neill sailed home in 1642, arriving that summer. Upon his arrival, he found he had a rival, in his cousin, Sir Phelim O'Neill. Military and political power was split between them, but the relationship was rocky, and as we left off, both O'Neills established alliances with the other's own rivals. Back across the Irish Sea, we last left the English Civil War with Charles's march on, and subsequent retreat from, London. He ended his withdrawal in Oxford, and the university city would become the royalist capital for the rest of the war. In the north, The Royalist General, the Earl of Newcastle, ended the year with a number of small but strategically important victories against the parliamentary forces in the region. It was here that we first met Sir Thomas Fairfax, currently the Lieutenant General of Horse under the command of his father. If you recall back to episode 227, Charles was hoping for a three-pronged assault on London. His own army in Oxford, marching from the centre east. Newcastle would come from the north, and an army from the southwest would march along the southern coast and take the capital from the south. The first two were viable, as we'll see, but the third was, as Nick Lipscomb puts it, a pipe dream. So, what was the situation in the southwest? In the latter half of 1642, the southwest saw some of the earliest skirmishes between royalists and parliamentarians. Cornwall, the southwesternmost county in England and the southwestern tip of the island of Great Britain, leaned royalist, but neighbouring Devon was far more divided. Many of Devon's larger towns, like Exeter and Plymouth, had suffered under incompetent royal administrators, and had large Puritan populations. Parliament's man, the Earl of Bedford, besieged the King's man, the Marquis of Hertford, in Sherborne Castle. Hartford soon escaped, with his entire force in tow, because, to be frank, Bedford didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know how to properly besiege a fortress, or how to prevent the besieged from simply breaking through his lines. Which is what Hartford did, marching all the way to the port of Minehead, where he took his artillery and his infantry aboard two ships, and sailed to meet with the king. On Bedford's part, with the bulk of the royalist force in the southwest now gone, he was summoned to meet up with the Earl of Essex's main force. When he sailed away, Hartford only took his infantry and artillery, because he only had so much space aboard the ships. He left his cavalry in the command of Ralph Hopton, who led his small force all the way down the southwest peninsula, deep into Cornwall, to the town of Truro. Here, a parliamentarian notable tried to have Hopton arrested for bringing soldiers into the county, but Hopton was able to convince the court that he was in the right. He did so well that instead of arresting Hopton and dispersing his troops, Truro ordered their trained bands raised and attached to Hopton's command. He left Truro in October with around 3,000 men, a mix of cavalry and infantry. From here, Hopton went from strength to strength, Hamstrung by the trained band's reluctance to march out of Cornwall, Hopton instead focused on securing Cornwall and recruiting volunteers who would follow him out of the county. By November, 
he was conducting raids into Devon and arranging for smugglers to break through Parliament's blockade carrying supplies. By December, Hopton's volunteer army was strong enough to march on Plymouth, a strong parliamentarian stronghold. Back in London, the Committee of Safety heard the reports of Hopton's success, and, even while preparing to defend the capital against the imminent arrival of the King's army, decided to do something about it. The Earl of Bedford was dispatched back to the southwest with just over a thousand men. He would be reinforced on his arrival by newly raised forces, paid for by Parliament, in both Devon and Cornwall. In the meantime, Hopton's success ran straight into a wall. Specifically, the wall which surrounded Plymouth. Here, the Parliamentarian commander, the Scottish colonel William Riven, held strong. When Hopton realised he had underestimated the defences of Plymouth, and attempted to recruit more men from the locals, Riven led a force of cavalry to break up the ad hoc recruiting party, and almost captured Hopton. Hopton then gave up on Plymouth, and decided to head further east, and try and take Exeter for the king. Again, Riven was a pain in his neck, successfully reinforcing the garrison by land and sea before Hopton could commence a siege. Hopton then tried to persuade the city fathers to open the gates, to no avail. On the 1st of January 1643, Hopton orders his troops to take the town by force. But Exeter's walls were too well defended, and he soon called off the attack. Low on supplies, and with the failures to take either Plymouth or Exeter weighing on his men's morale, Hopton ordered his small army back to Cornwall. Five days later, the Parliamentarian Earl of Stamford arrived at the head of two and a half thousand men, and he planned to link up with Riven at Plymouth. On the 13th of January, Riven's army crossed the River Tamar and entered Cornwall, determined to chase down the low morale and poorly supplied Royalists, without waiting for all of Stamford's reinforcements, only taking along the vanguard he'd already met. Except Hopton's army was no longer dispirited or badly supplied. Through a twist of fate, two parliamentary ships had been forced to take shelter in Falmouth Harbour, only for them to be seized by the Royalists. The ships now declared for the King, and offloaded their cargo of arms, ammunition, and other supplies including a large amount of cash. Hopton wisely used this money to pay his men. So now, Hopton's army was as motivated as it could be, and armed to the teeth. At a council of war on the 18th of January, it was decided to take the fight to Riven. The next day, Hopton's vanguard engaged Riven's at Braddock Down, and with both sides determined to fight a pitched battle, they drew up on opposite hills. Hopton outnumbered Riven, though not overwhelmingly, with about 5,000 men under his command versus Riven's 4,000. The key advantage the royalist commander had, and which would win the day for him, was that the parliamentarian troops were green and inexperienced. When the battle began, both sides stayed firmly on their respective hills, firing at each other at long range and doing very little damage in the process. One of the commanders later recounted how, quote, we saluted each other with bullets, with both determined to keep their ground of advantage and have the other to come over to his prejudice, end quote. In other words, neither side wanted to give up their higher ground and march closer to the people with guns. That is, until Hopton realised the parliamentarians had not properly set up their artillery. At this point, he moved his cavalry, exposing his own guns which they had blocked from the view of the enemy. After pelting the enemy ranks with cannon, Hopton gave the order, and his infantry advanced. Riven's infantry managed to let off a volley of musket fire, but Hopton's infantry just kept advancing, surrounding them on three sides, and this broke the spirit of the inexperienced parliamentarian troops. One unit turned and fled, then another. Then everyone ran. It was a complete rout. Riven's men fled five miles up the road towards the town of Liscard, pursued by the royalists all the way. When they reached the town, instead of shelter, they found the townsfolk angrily brandishing pitchforks at them. Between the Liscardians and Hopton's Cornish royalists, between 
1,250 and 1,500 men were captured alive. Riven managed to escape back to Plymouth with the remains of his army, while Hopton sent a detachment to push Stamford's main force out of Cornwall, which was successful. Yet, once again, Hopton was unable to break into Devon. Plymouth could not be starved into submission. It was a major port, and Hopton didn't have the ships to blockade it. Neither did he have the numbers to storm the town either. Hopton faced stiff resistance at Chagford on the 8th of February, likely facing Stamford's main force, and two weeks later lost a hundred men and some artillery at Modbury. Once again, Hopton returned to Cornwall with his tail between his legs. The stalemate had not been broken. Charles's southwestern army was not coming. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical, my two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A B B E L dot com code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. In the opening months of 1643, it's possible to see the war shift from its first political phase into a second territorial phase. In the first phase, which basically extends from the beginning of the conflict to the standoff outside London at Turnham Green, many contemporaries hoped and believed that the crisis would be resolved with a short, sharp shock of a pitched battle. The winner would then be in a position to enforce their terms, and peace would return to England. Hence the rush towards London by Charles, and the rush by Essex to confront him. Whether this was ever a possibility is debatable. Peter Gaunt, in his The English Civil War, A Military History, suggests that even an overwhelming and crushing royalist victory at Edge Hill wouldn't have ended the war, since Parliament would still hold London and its resources and could continue to fight. He admits that a parliamentary victory, where the king was captured, could have been enough to end the war, but even that isn't to certainty. As we'll see, even capture and imprisonment won't convince Charles that he's been defeated. Either way, in the aftermath of Turnham Green, we see a shift in strategy, matching the realisation that this was not going to be a quick war. More and more, the focus remained on securing territory, securing resources and supplies, and denying both to the enemy. If this wasn't going to be settled by a short, sharp shock, then both sides would grind down the other into submission. But the hope for a political resolution remained alive. In the early months of 1643, both King and Parliament attempted to straddle two lines. Both put effort into negotiating peace, but both also prepared to win the war militarily. Partly this situation came about from the indecisive nature of the earlier battles. While bloody, Edge Hill had been inconclusive, and at Turnham Green, neither side was prepared to attack the other. Had either King or Parliament achieved an overwhelming military victory, they would naturally be better positioned to enforce their terms on the other, 
War is continuation of politics by other means, after all. But since neither had undeniably defeated the other, this left negotiations in much the same place they'd been since the summer of 1642. Their positions were mutually exclusive, with neither being willing to concede any significant ground, while also being unable to force the other to make concessions. This muddle explains the failure of the Treaty of Oxford, which is far too grand a title for what was, essentially, just the latest iteration of the argument between the King and Parliament. In January, envoys from London arrived, requesting that the King return to his capital and guaranteeing his safety. It was all very civil. The Earls of Northumberland, Holland, Pembroke and Salisbury arrived, along with five MPs, and they all showed the proper courtesy, kissing the rings of both the King and then the Prince of Wales. The terms of peace were much the same as the 19 propositions, which, if you remember, the King had rejected out of hand. So in turn, Charles sent his own counter-proposals and requested the cessation of hostilities and the disbanding of everyone's armies. Now, the House of Lords accepted these terms, but the Commons did not, and sent their own counter-counter-proposals at the end of February, which Charles countered with his own, etc., etc., you get the point. The Parliamentarian Commissioners returned to London in April, and the Treaty of Oxford was dead before it even came close to reality. Because, as I said, both sides were continuing to try and win this war the conventional way, even while entertaining the idea of a peace treaty. One of the most important developments in December 1642, which shows these preparations, on Parliament's side at least, were the two ordinances, which created first the Midlands Association, and then the Eastern Association. These associations were intended to combine the resources and the administration of a number of counties into one, for better command and control over a traditionally demilitarised society. The Midland Association was made up of Leicester, Nottingham, Northampton, Bedford, Buckingham, Rutland, Derby, and Huntingdon. The Eastern Association contained Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, Hertfordshire, and Essex. Over the next couple of years, the Eastern Association in particular will play an increasingly important part in Parliament's military machine. Other county associations will be created as the war goes on to better manage the parliamentarian war effort. On the 24th of February, Parliament passed an ordinance to raise money for their armies. The question of how to actually pay their soldiers will remain an ever-present problem for both sides. In the North, several issues became increasing problems for Newcastle to handle. The first and most immediately obvious problem was his army's shortage of supplies, particularly weapons and ammunition. The largest arsenal in the region had been at Hull, and was now far beyond the Royalists' reach. The second problem was the sudden return of the Queen. Henrietta Maria disembarked at Bridlington after her extended stay in the Netherlands, trying to drum up political and material support for her husband the King. She'd been only marginally successful in this, but she did at least return laden with weaponry for Charles's army. Now you might think that this solved Newcastle's first problem, his lack of guns and ammunition, you would be wrong to think so, because when I said the Queen brought weaponry for Charles's army, I mean Charles's army, his Oxford army. It was ordered on to the new royalist capital without delay, something I'm sure pleased Newcastle not one bit. Newcastle was left in the same position as before, except now he had a Queen to manage and protect. If she came to harm, it would be his head, quite possibly literally. The third issue was the aggressive approach of enemy commanders, especially Sir Thomas Fairfax. He had countered Newcastle's earlier successes with some of his own. By the end of 1642, he had forced Newcastle back to York, and on the 23rd of January, he recaptured Leeds for the Parliamentarians, restoring communication and supply links between Parliament's strongholds in the West Riding of Yorkshire and at Hull. A week later, another Parliamentarian commander, whose name I won't bother you with, captured Nantwich. In the weeks after that, the Lancashire towns of Lancaster and Preston in the northwest were taken for Parliament, and the town of Bolton was successfully defended from an attack by the Royalist Lord Derby. If you don't know English geography, don't worry, 
The important thing is that these were a string of important parliamentarian successes which threatened to cut off the Earl of Newcastle from the south and leave him unable to communicate with the king. The last significant gap in the parliamentarian cordon was at Newark, which I incorrectly stated in episode 227 was captured by Parliament. I can't even blame the complexity of the timeline for this, or getting confused with names, I just straight up misread the sentence. Mia culpa, mia maxima culpa. Newark was actually captured for the Royalists by one Sir John Henderson, who remained in command with a small garrison at the end of February, when the Parliamentarian General, Thomas Ballard, arrived at the head of a large force, determined to take the town and sever Newcastle from communication and supply. For two days, the forces of Ballard and Henderson fought. Henderson's men fighting tooth and nail, while Ballard was apparently an incompetent general. Ballard was driven off, and Henderson remained in control of Newark. Newcastle was relieved at the news he could still coordinate with his king. Better news came at the end of March, as Henrietta Maria earned her keep by persuading the parliamentarian Hugh Cholmley, commander of Scarborough Castle, to switch sides. This was an achievement, to be sure, but she was also working on Hotham, the governor of Hull, and she was less successful. He would need more convincing. Back in the South, as negotiations for the poorly named Treaty of London were ongoing, the Earl of Essex, true to his cautious nature and his desire for a peaceful political solution, made no major moves of his own. The same cannot be said for his subordinate, Colonel William Waller, who had spent most of December leading a string of successes. On the 1st of December, he captured Farnham Castle in Surrey, about halfway between London and the ancient city of Winchester, where he was a freeman and owned the castle. Then, Waller was ordered to recapture the town of Marlborough, which had recently fallen to the Royalists. When Waller's large army approached, the garrison took one look at that, took one look at the lack of defences that Marlborough had, and decided to flee. Waller chased them south, all the way to Winchester. The town refused to surrender to Parliament. Despite his responsibility to the city, Waller ordered his artillery to breach the walls, which they did on the 12th of December. The following day, Winchester Castle, which Waller owned, surrendered, and about 600 men were taken prisoner. Then, Waller did something he would regret for the rest of his life. Bowing to pressure from his men, he allowed them to sack the city. Under the rules of war, since the town had refused to surrender and had then been taken by storm, a light sacking was acceptable. The castle, and other property held by Waller in the city, was damaged in the violence, which Waller himself took as a message from God of his displeasure. Winchester was soon recaptured by the Royalists, but by then Waller had moved on. By the end of the month, Waller had captured the castles of Arundel and South Sea, and with them established his reputation as William the Conqueror, as the Presses of London so cleverly named him. When Parliament instituted the Western Association early in February, consisting of Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, Shropshire, Wiltshire, and Somerset, who better to be its Major General than William the Conqueror Waller. Well, as far as Essex was concerned, there were quite a few people who would be better than Waller. The two did not get on. But Parliament was becoming increasingly frustrated with Essex's passive approach to the war, and the energetic and successful Waller was exactly what they wanted. But Essex didn't have to like the appointment, and he was still overall commander of Parliament's armies. So when Waller set off to set up his headquarters at the city of Bristol, he went with only 2,000 men. It was a slight which Waller did not miss, and Essex did not try to hide, and their working relationship would only get worse. This didn't hold Waller back, though, and on the 3rd of March, he once again captured Winchester. Thanks for listening to Pax Britannica. Since the last episode, I've updated a list of all my patrons on the website, if you're currently a patron of the rank of Earl or above, go to paxbritannica.info slash supporters to see your name and title in lights. Or at least in text. Remember that every patron, regardless of rank, 
receives an RSS feed which you can put in any podcast app to listen to the podcast ad-free. Thank you to everyone who has supported me on Patreon, left a review, or told a friend about the podcast. All of this supports me in one way or another, and it's greatly appreciated. Thanks to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>